Okay, folks, we're just giving everyone a few seconds to get logged in here. Uh, if you are already in the webinar tonight with us, you can open up the chat window and find some information about how to buy tonight's featured book, Love Sack. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're excited to welcome you to our online event series, Squawkin' Sports, hosted by Patrick Sauer and David J. Roth. For this installment, they'll be chatting with Reed Forgrave about his new book, Love Sack, Small Town Football and the Life and Death of an American Boy. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to our hosts, Patrick and David, and to tonight's featured author, Reed, for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make this space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of your fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. There are a couple of different functions we'll be using throughout tonight's event that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen tonight. Uh, one of those is labeled chat. It's an icon with one speech bubble. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat throughout tonight's event. That is a great way to show your appreciation for the author and to interact with your fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find that by clicking the icon labeled Q&A that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social channels later on. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Loves That, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to be able to offer actual shopping in our bookstore locations, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Tuesday through Sunday and you can purchase Reed's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Now for tonight's speakers. Our hosts for this evening are Patrick Sauer and David J. Roth. Patrick has written for many large publica publications you've heard of and even more small ones that no longer exist. He's a founding member of the Billings, Montana to Brooklyn sports writing pipeline. David was an editor at Deadspin and is now a co-founder and co-owner at Defector.com. His writings appeared in The New Republic, The New Yorker, Food and Wine, and The Baffler. They'll be speaking with featured author Reed Forgrave. He writes about sports and other topics for GQ, The New York Times Magazine, and Mother Jones, among other publications. He has covered the NFL and college football for FoxSports.com and CBS Sports, and he currently writes for the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. The article in which he first wrote about Zach Easter is included in Best American Sports Writing 2018. A past life found him working at the Des Moines Register in Iowa, where he wrote long form narrative journalism and covered the state's first in the nation presidential caucuses. His new book, Love Zach, is the deeply reported and powerfully moving true story of Zach Easter a 24-year-old from small town Iowa who decided to take his own life rather than continue his losing battle against the traumatic brain injuries he had sustained as a no-holds-barred high school football player. 
Reed is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then he'll be talking with Patrick and David and with all of you. Patrick, David, and Reed, please take it away. Thanks, Chelsea. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'll start this off with, with a reading, I suppose. Uh, as Chelsea suggested, first of all, I just want to say, like, thank you to Greenlight Books. Uh, I've been to one of your locations uh, in New York, and it is an awesome bookstore. Uh, so I would encourage everyone, uh, first of all, buy my book, but specifically buy it from Greenlight Books. Uh, it's also a thrill. I wish this were in person because, you know, being in a bookstore in Brooklyn would, sounds really nice right now. Um, but even though it isn't, it's, it's a thrill to be on with two writers I've admired for a very long time. So, uh, uh, Patrick. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. That's uh, the first compliment we've ever gotten. So you're the best <laughs> guest we've ever had. Yeah, a lot of people, you could tell that they like really think I'm wearing cool shirts and stuff, but they don't ever say it. That's, so that is the only out loud compliment that we've got. My, my mom, uh, I did one of these last night in my uh, hometown of Pittsburgh. My mom was on uh, this. It was with like her friend who owns a bookstore. And she yelled at me about my shirt because it was I was wearing the same Zoom shirt for every single one of these. So I changed shirts. Uh, so I actually have a new shirt. And it's Savvy. Sticky. That's, it that's looks stuff well, you can't teach. It looks well pressed. <laughs> it is actually. Ironing is strangely one of my few uh, hot, like, like household chores that I enjoy. Um, so nothing like one of those like real easy tactile tasks where like it looks like you can see like a pile of things that are different yes. than they were before you did it. And it, it, it gets roughly done in this, in, like an entire pile of uh, ironing gets done in the same time, two and three, two, between two to three hours. So uh, between it's like an NBA game or most of the yeah. game. Uh, I like uh, three beers. So it's like a very manly way to iron. Yeah. I like this. Uh, throat clearing banter uh, <laughs> first all like oh the book yeah it lo i mean look the book's about what it's about if you want to stay talking about ironing uh we can do it <laughs> jimmy butler irons the hell out of things um yeah. all right no let's, he doesn't even he doesn't even use an iron man it's just his hands <laughs> let's let's get to it yeah let's talk about the book <laughs> back around to ironing and stuff this love zach by reed forgrave so i i'm worried that this book either uh completely misses like 2020 because no one wants to read about suicide and concussions and and football in this awful chaotic year or maybe it just like hits the zeitgeist uh what this book is about is uh it's about a 24 year old man named zach easter from small town iowa the fact that he's from iowa i think is a very important part of this book because it is ingrained into who he is he is a man's man and his father created him to be that way uh, he's the middle of three boys, and they grew up, you know, this is a family that's been on this same plot of land for seven generations since before the Civil War. And their way to prove masculinity in the 21st century, you know, it used to be, you know, either you go fight in a war, you join the military, or you go work the land. Now it's kind of football. Zach was in the military, but uh, for him, football was very much a manliness test. Uh, this book is sad. Uh, it's a cautionary tale. It is not a book that is railing against football. I think it, in a clear-eyed way, talks about the risks of football, but also the rewards of football. Uh, I think this is, I mean, not to get too high-minded about it. I'm going to read a, just the prologue to this book in just a second, but this book is about, it's a sports book. I mean, sorry, it's a book about sports, but it's not a sports book. It's about parenting. It's about what we value as a country. It's about that line, that very blurry line between traditional masculinity and toxic masculinity. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I think this is a vital tale, even though we are focused on so many other things other than football and the dangers that it can pose. I do think this is a vital tale about America and about kind of how we raise our boys to be men. So I'm going to read the prologue, trigger warning of sorts. Uh, this is dark. This is Zach's first suicide attempt. Uh, it was from November 2015, five weeks before he completed uh, his suicide attempt. Uh, and that's not a spoiler alert. You know going into this book that this things aren't going to end well for Zach. Um, so this will be a, a fairly short reading and then we get to chat. <clears throat> Zach Easter stood on the long wooden dock leading out onto Lake Aquabi, 
gripping the 40 caliber pistol he'd given his dad for Father's Day, not even five months before. The sun had dipped over the horizon on the other side of the Y-shaped lake. Leaves lay in heaps on the fringe of the woods. The gusty November winds died down as the sun sank on the horizon, but there was still a chill in the air. Winter was coming. Zach took out his phone and snapped a picture. He posted it to Snapchat, ignoring the frantic phone calls that were pouring into his phone. God bless America, he captioned the photo. Where is Zach? All around Zach's hometown, friends and family were terrified. They'd seen his Facebook post a few minutes before. If you're reading this, then God bless the times we've had together. Please forgive me. I'm taking the selfish road out. Only God understands what I've been through. I will always watch over you. They needed to stop him, but how? They didn't even know where he was. From the house where Zach grew up, a few miles away and amidst fields of corn, his parents called. Zach did not pick up. From the small town just down the street where Zach had played high school football, and from Des Moines, the big capital city not quite 20 miles to the north, his friends called. Zach did not pick up. At 5.36 p.m., a college roommate texted him. Hey, what are you up to, bud? No reply. From the law school at Case Western Reserve University, almost 700 miles away in Cleveland, Ohio, Allie Epperson, Zach's girlfriend and the only person to whom he had fully confided his struggles with his rapidly deteriorating brain, called. Zach did not pick up. She called again. He did not pick up. She called again. Finally, Zach picked up. There was terror in his voice. I can't do this, he told her. It's never going to get better. Allie, a vivacious law student, who in many ways was Zach's opposite, a bleeding heart liberal who balanced out Zach's dyed-in-the-wool conservatism, was freaking out. How many hours had she spent on the phone with him, talking about the disease that seemed to be eating his brain from the inside? How many times had the two talked about the sport he loved, the sport that had consumed much of his childhood, but now seemed to be consuming the rest of his life as well? How many times had she told him that a real man was not stoic and unfeeling, that a real man must face his demons instead of suffering silently in deference to some antiquated ideal of masculinity? How many times had she told him not to apologize to her, that she loved him despite the crazy stuff that was going on, and that they would work through it all together? Earlier on this day, Friday the 13th of all days in November 2015, he had apologized again. I'm sorry you fell in love with a guy with a ducked up brain, Zach had texted her, his phone's autocorrect softening the swear word. He'd awoken early, started drinking, and called Allie in a panic late in the morning, shit-faced and swerving his car around the suburbs. She'd coaxed, at him to dri- she'd coaxed him to drive into a gas station, then into a Jimmy John's to grab a sandwich and sober up. She'd calmed him like she always did. He'd apologized like he always did. She had texted him back. You can't choose who you fall in love with. You just fall in love. Then he texted an ominous reply. If anything happens to me, just by a chance of luck, tell my family everything. Now things were happening. A friend noticed the setting of Zach's Snapchat photo, the beach on Lake Aquabi, where Zach and Allie had escaped to in the summer to get away from high school friends and stare at the clouds. The lake was just down the road from his family's house. The lake's name is derived from an ancient Algonquian language. It means resting place. Allie kept Zach on the phone. Listen to the sound of my voice, she soothed him. Listen to the sound of my voice. I'm losing my mind, he cried. This is it for me. One Warren County Sheriff's Office cruiser came speeding down the winding hill toward the lake, followed by another. Allie, did you send these cops here? The cops got closer to him. He started apologizing to Allie and he told her he wanted his brain donated for research. Then, Zach's phone cut out. Out on the dock, Zach pointed the pistol at the darkened sky and fired a warning shot. That is when a pickup truck sped down the hill and slammed to a stop next to the lake. Zach's father, a burly former high school football coach named Miles Easter, jumped out. The parking lot quickly filled with squad cars. One deputy, a former all-conference linebacker, who played for Miles on the same high school team Zach had played for, trained his assault rifle on Zach. Lasers from other police rifles danced on Zach's body. 
The evening was dark and it was getting cold. Miles saw the cherry red 2008 Mazda 3, Zach called Old Red. He peered into the window of his son's car. He saw an empty six pack of Coors Light, an empty bottle of Captain Morgan rum, and a pill bottle. Floodlights illuminated Zach. A black curtain fell in the water behind him. Zach stood up from a picnic table and walked down the pier toward a wooden fishing hut at water's edge. A few more steps and he'd be inside, alone on the water, out of sight. Put your gun down, the deputy shouted. Nope, Zach yelled with an anguished laugh. Not gonna do that. In a flash, Zach's father realized what was happening. Zach wants the police to shoot him. Fuck it, Miles said to himself. I can't let this happen. Zach's father sprinted past the sheriff's deputies and onto the pier. Zach, he shouted. If he shoots me, he shoots me, the father thought. Dad, stop. As Miles re- Easter ran toward his son, Zach's face came into focus. His blue eyes looked foggy and confused. The expression on his still boyish face matched the tenor of his voice. Sad, sick, exhausted, scared. Worn down by life, beaten once and for all. Zach, I'm coming, Miles said. Put your gun down. Dad, Zach shouted. Dad, stop. Then, gripping his father's pistol, Zach disappeared into the fishing hunt. The door slammed shut behind him, and Zach Easter was alone. Well, <laughs> welcome to Squawkin' Sports. Yeah. Uh, I want to say, you know, up the, in the beginning, we were sort of joking, but I, this book is so well done and so real and human that it's, with everything going on, and I don't want to get any farther than that, <laughs> um, it, it, it actually was like re- remembering what people go through as opposed to all of the circus that's currently going on now. It, you know, it's the difference between reading a story about a kid who lost both parents to COVID versus reading Twitter, you know, uh, bad mouthing the president. And there was something bracing about reading this book during this time that I think, um, like you said, if you, it's not escapism, it's the opposite, but it's, um, it's deeply human and very moving uh, in a way that reminded me that, you know, there's more going on than the dumb shit that we're all um, obsessed with. And so on that level, you know, I, I think this book is timed perfectly. If that's, I don't think that probably sold any more books, but. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's tough. It's, you had to know, I mean, it's a book about, about suffering and, and a family yeah. suffering and an individual suffering and like, there's also a lot of suffering going on, but that is true at all times. I think in Lumi- like Patrick was saying, I think illuminating it as humanely as you did is an achievement for sure. We, I, 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 I appreciate that because I, I feel like the human connection, like if there's one way that this book can kind of break out of the shit storm that is 2020, like the book that I'm reading right now is total escapism, right? It's just about the Lakers and Kobe. Yeah. I, I, I interviewed I interviewed Jeff for the LA Times in my book. It was, that was a total nice diversion. It was great. And I, it, it's awesome because I like feel like it's like 2001 when I'm reading that book, like pre 9-11, 2001. Yeah. Um, and this book is, it's not that, right? It's not escapism that way, but I, I feel like there is that human connection. Uh, we, we had pretty extensive discussions with the publisher in April, May, June about whether we should push it back a year. Um, the bigger concern, I think, was, was the NFL going to cancel their season? Um, because if the NFL canceled the season, this book isn't about the NFL, but it's about football, and the NFL is football, right? And right. if they cancel their season, this book would feel – it would be, be being released at a very weird time added on to everything else. But uh, no, I appreciate you guys saying that because I think there is something that's like very extremely real about this book. It's obviously sad, but it's also like there's like a deep level of human connection in here uh, between Zach and his parents, between Zach and his girlfriend, and, and hopefully like just between Zach and the reader. Because I think why this is a book why this was a magazine article in the first place is because of Zach's words. Like he left behind all these writings, these journals, this like typed up autobiography. Uh, his girlfriend gave me all these text messages. And this book is, is it's almost as much Zach's writing as it is mine in a way. Um, 
Before we get into the conversation, because there are some hard questions uh, about the family that are probably going to be asked, I think it's fair to the Easter family. Um, could you just give us the timeline? Because to me, I would say CTE public starts with uh, Jean Marie Las Laskus's GQ article. I mean, I sort of think that's when the world meets um, Dr. Bennett uh, Omalu uh, and yeah, I, so yeah I, I, and that is. I looked it up, that was uh, September 2009. So what is Zach's, uh, just cause I, the family, it, yeah. let's just assume nobody in uh, the family or in Indianola is doing any deeper research into the 70s, 80s. Uh, so where's the family at and where's the science at when that article comes out? I mean, it's, it's very sadly ironic because Zach's senior year of high school started in August 2009. Okay. He suffered one concussion in August at a preseason camp. He suffered one in September at an early game, and they suffered one in October. This is just as this stuff, like you're saying, is hitting the consciousness. It's just as Alan, Alan Schwartz is writing these stories for the New York Times that's equating, I think his very first story came out right around that same time in 2009, equating this, this crazy disease with the perils of playing professional football is about Andre Waters. So Zach's parents, his father is a hard ass, right? I really like his dad. And I'm imagining that's one of the things we're going to talk about, the feelings about his dad uh, eventually in this conversation. Uh, he's a hard ass. He's a football guy. And I think he's able to have plausible deniability in a way because in the, when Zach, was growing up, it was that first decade, you know, 2000 to 2010 was his playing career, third grade through high school. We, nobody was talking about this. Like Mike Webster died and we were like, oh, that's freaky. We hear these crazy stories about Mike Webster and the super glue and using a taser to go to sleep. I don't, but that just seemed like such an anomaly. And it wasn't really until Gene's story in GQ in uh, 2009 that became the movie, eventually became the movie Concussion that was sort of one of the seminal moments in like opening up the national discussion. So it, in a way they, they sort of have an excuse, like a very valid excuse that they kept kind of pushing, if not pushing him out, then at least being like, okay, I guess you can go out and play more. Cause you know, he's a, he's a senior year in high school. You want to go play football. And it's totally, it's totally different than five years after that. Or yeah. yeah, absolutely. In a way, like, being a parent now, I got two young boys and it's almost more difficult now because we know what can happen, but we don't like the science hasn't fully caught up and we don't fully know like the reason for CTE or, you know, mild traumatic brain injury and what that can really lead to and the difference between concussions and, and subconcussive hits. And by the way, I'm way more scared about subconcussive hits than I am about like those big, uh, yeah, the like jacked up kill shot like yeah, things. Exactly. You don't see as much of that anymore either. That's I think there's something really interesting, like sort of the middle third of the book, you you get into this about like sort of living in that liminal space, the way that the sport is right now, where, where there's so much more is known than was known 10 years ago. But there's still this like sense in which you talk about these sort of attempts to come up with like equipment that would be more sensitive to measuring this stuff or to like or to protecting against it and all that and like I have my own issues and, and doubts sort of with that but we're in this this period now where we know the damage that can be done there's and presuming that there is some sort of solution out there in the future we're, we're in this space in between in all the ways that, you know, you don't want to keep saying that the book sort of rhymes with the, the moment, but that anxiety really like felt very urgent given where we are as a country in terms of the, you know, the pandemic. But I think with a, a great deal of other sort of problems that there's, there is something weirdly wrenching about reading the injuries that Zach sort, sort of suffers. And then uh, the athletic trainer who's a very interestingly drawn uh, character, Sue, uh, that pulls him out of games and just gets no backup from anybody because everybody was just sort of like, yeah, like, what are you doing? Like, the, you got his bell rung, sign back in. It's, 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 she's a fascinating character because I think she very much symbolizes this moment. She's hired, Sue Wilson is her name. She's the athletic trainer 
at Zach's high school. She's hired in the mid 2000s to be their trainer. Just as Zach is, I think he was in seventh or eighth grade uh, when she was hired. And the fact that she's a female operating in a men's world, I think is very instructive to what her role becomes because she was, frankly, she was paying attention to the dangers of concussions more than, I know she's in small town Iowa, but more than just about anyone at that point. And she would, when a player would have what she suspected was a concussion, and remember, like, it's suspected. There's no x-ray. There's no sideline test that you can say definitively this is a concussion. She'd take the player's helmet away, and she'd say, I'm taking this. And she and the coaches would rail on her. The players would would cuss her out. The, the fans would, would be pissed off about it. Even, like, the parents of the players would be like, put him back in. He deserves to go back in. Um, there was one time when a doctor who, you know, was a, you know, lived in the community and was in the stands after the game went up to, it was either the superintendent or the principal. And he's like, what are her credentials? Does she really have the credentials to be able to do that? Is that the same guy that told Zach he should pray more? Cause I, <laughs> I hated that guy the most. Yeah. He was a dick. That guy sounded like a dick. <laughs> What's interesting is, uh, yeah, Zach went to him thinking he had issues, and she, he's like, oh, you're a great guy, and just gave, gave him like a, you're a great guy, be a good Christian talk. Uh, someone from Indianola sent me a note uh, a few weeks ago saying, I think I had, I had an eating disorder when I was in high school, and I think I had that same doctor. What was his name? Same doctor, by the wow. way. Um, yeah. And I bet they prayed, uh, they prayed the bulimia away. They did pray it's, the bulimia away. It's the only thing that's been proven to work. <laughs> Um, fucking grim dude it's, it's funny when you talk about like the toxic masculinity which is almost the thing that's now thrown around and starting to lose what I think it's supposed to mean but the three to me the three uh, most important people in Zach's life who are on his side are Sue Allie and his mom and uh, you know the, the, the former soldier um, uh, doctor that he sees yeah. as a uh, but it's kind of those four, three of them are women, and it's just on its face, sort of, that's the reality of it. You know, the, the, the phrase toxic masculinity, I think you're right. It is kind of losing its meaning because it gets tossed out so much. And on, on one of these uh, Zoom calls a few weeks ago, someone brought up, isn't football just toxic masculinity boiled down to its essence? And I think about it, like, I mean, yeah, to an to an extent, but there's also like, is that type of masculinity necessarily toxic, right? Like is teaching your son to, to suck it up, to fight through the pain, uh, to not complain, uh, to, to be tough, is that necessarily a bad thing? Like I think it can be a bad thing. It eventually led to Zach's demise, right? Because he had brain pain and uh, that's just way more dangerous and scary. Yeah. But I mean, I can remember when my first son was born, they, they, they take him over to the, whatever, the warming table or whatever it is. They smack him around and I go over there and I'm crying and he grabs onto my finger and I have this little speech that I'm ready to give him. And I was like, Owen, I'm dad. I want you to be kind and I want you to be strong. But like, those were the two things that were like, I want a strong son. Is that toxic? Like, well, and I don't want to go too far down the road of like, should football exist? I read Steve Allman's book. I interviewed him at the time it came out. Oh, yeah. It's very strident. And I think in some ways, like, dude, you made a bunch of good points. But also everybody who likes football is not. Uh, yeah. Preaching not, to the choir on that one for yeah, sure. Yeah. It, it's not a uh, incel uh, <laughs> subculture. Um, but I do think it's interesting in where I think where. The problem, the book, and the, the 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 masculinity part of the book that's really hard to handle is the, not in the early playing of football. I mean that you know I played high school football. I did all that tape. Although we didn't have a trainer, we taped ourselves, which worked out really well. Um, uh, one in fifteen, my two years on varsity, zero and eight senior campaign, go Rams. Should sure had nothing uh, to do with you though. I led the team in receptions, and I think I had seven. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there's there's a point. I, the, the, let's just go into it because to me it's the most it's the scene in the book that I will never forget, and I can't wrap my head around it. Zach shows up at home in a cold November morning. He's wearing t-shirt 
and tennis shoes, correct me if I'm wrong, and his dad takes him hunting, knowing that he has a mental, he's having a mental breakdown, basically, and then gives him beer, knowing that he's been uh, in an alcoholic stupor the whole time. That's the one part where it's like, what the, what do you do? That's, I guess that's the scene that I can't get around. The, the, the specifics of that moment was he was supposed to, this was after his, that, after this, this first suicide attempt that I, uh, that I read. And there were five weeks between that attempt and when he did die. And it was, I think it was the beginning of deer season in Iowa. And it was like, father and sons were going out uh, to go hunting. And this was, the, this was the moment where Zach's dad realizes, oh man, this kid's messed up. Uh, because he, he's like, Zach, show, show up at the hunting place. Uh, I have your gun, you bring your boots. And he forgets his boots, he shows up in, you know, totally not ready. And he's like, and Zach's like, I got my gun. He didn't have his gun. It was, it was just like, he just kind of like lost his mind in a way. Um, and then they go out and, and, and his father was like, what the hell is this? And then they go out and they have this beautiful father Sunday. And it was like, it had always been. And some of Zach's moments, some of his favorite moments were out hunting. And his dad felt that Zach was normal again. And on the drive back, they drink beers in the car, which is what Miles Easter does. It's, Small town Iowa, man. Like, this is, this is not uncommon. And then, like, Zach's dad's like, oh, I think everything's good again. And then the older brother's like, Dad, I could see Zach talking to himself when we were out there hunting. Uh, he's messed up. And like, this was, like, the moment that hit him. Uh, but he's still it – was, it's was weird because, like, Zach's dad is so in this culture of, like, rural America manliness. Uh, Donald Trump. Yeah. football, hunting, being tough. That's, that, that's like him in a nutshell. He loves his son. I, I think he does. But you, you, I mean, he loves them deeply. I think it's, it's very clear. You know, I think even from that, from that, from that reading where he goes out and he tr basically tries to save his son. Um, but he can't get himself out of that, that sort of like masculine nature. I mean, he said to him, I think the joke that he made to him was he gave him the gun to go hunting. He's like, you're not going to shoot yourself, are you? And Zach's like, no. Classic. Which is, yeah, it's fucked up, right? It's totally great bit. <laughs> yeah, but that's, I think that's a tension that runs through the book. It's, you know, sometimes obviously more explicit than others, but the, like to the extent that, you know, that this book is a critique of masculinity, which I don't think that it is, the way that that stood out the most to me is not in terms of like the ideals that are behind any of this, because I think, being tough, being willing to sacrifice, all of that shit obviously is like the, the fundamentals of what it is to be a good person, not man or woman or whatever. But the confronted with this problem that is beyond their capacity, every male character in this book bumps up against the limitations of what th the upbringing they had and the, the sort of the guidance that they had of what it provides them that it like it teaches you to deal with a certain type of problem but not on the scale that they face that there's like and that is heartbreaking not just because of of zach's suffering and, and his diary which does take up a good deal of the book like you can feel him kind of like he doesn't know how to talk about the anguish that he has mm -hmm. or how to understand it and that is like really I think the thing that's going to stay with me the most from it is just like how stymied and kind of thwarted so many of the men in this book are like, they know what's right and, also, and wrong. They just can't get there. And also the, the, they turn to, um, you know, I, Miles Easter, you know, as we just talked about, you can see a lot of problems, but none of these guys are like full on Trumpian assholes. Like uh, you're a pussy, get a, but they do all turn to like this Tony Robertsy, uh, you know, these fake, it, you know, you, you can add, you can equate it to religion, self-help, whatever. But let's not really address the problem. Let's wake up this morning and uh, do our push-ups, and you know, their solutions are 
as heartbreaking as almost the worldview itself, if that makes any sense. Like, yeah. I, I, I did not want Zach, I wanted Zach to stop reading Tony Roberts and get, <laughs> get some real help. And his brain might have been too damaged. That's the under, other thing I've heard about this book. His brain may have been too damaged to be saved. Which is, which is remark. That, that's why I think like his writings are pretty remarkable. How yeah, they're, they're, they're amazing. They are like not, he, you can see where he's bouncing all over the place. Um, but the fact that he is documenting how he is bouncing o- all over the place to me is it's a remarkable document, I guess. Like, and, and that he had the force, the forethought to leave that behind knowing that there could be value in that. Uh, telling his parents to to go tell my story. I think that is, uh, uh, for someone who's going through that sort of brain issues, it's pretty remarkable. I, the, you guys brought up the, sort of the people in his corner being females. And it's a really, uh, it's something that I hadn't, I don't think fully put together, but it's a great point. And, and, and with Zach, he was always a mama's boy. Like him and Brenda, him and his mom were, were, were like this. They, with his older brother, it wasn't like that. The older brother was not as in touch with his feelings as Zach. Uh, the older brother had plenty of concussions himself. He's fine with it. He's just like kind of a hard ass. He's a lot like his dad. Zach's a lot like his mom, uh, a little more sensitive, a little more in touch with his feelings. And, and funny, I think we should point out, his writings are generally funny. Yeah. Like he would make masturbation jokes yeah. and then be like, I got to stop eating McDonald's. My brain's messed up. I love it. Like he's a funny kid. It's yeah, it's, not, it's like a natural voice. Like it really, I don't know, he's very well drawn by his own hand in that way. Yeah, yeah you know, I, uh, he's profane and real and he talks about things that are, I mean, he thinks he's writing it to his diary, right? And, and so it's very personal and at times very embarrassing. Um, my wife made me tone down like all the profanity in my own prose in the book because she's like zach has enough of it yeah that's my was, that's that's a good edit that's a good edit no. it is a good edit you have to be able to draw a distinction between the two of you you know um not no matter how close you get to your your subject there <laughs> that's totally true man it's totally true um, so there's something can we talk a little bit about the participation of his family and ali and like because it seems like this is i mean obviously it's a journalistic achievement on your part to pull all of this stuff together and to contextualize it as you did. But also it seems like a lot of people were very interested in making sure that this story got told all the way. Yeah. That's a, and it's a great point. This, this would not be a book if it weren't for Zach's writings and it wouldn't be a book without Zach explicitly giving instructions to his family. I think, I think it's, we should, we should, we should point out, you were there two weeks after his death, right? I was, so I was back. He died six days before Christmas of 2015. I was on the phone with his mom. I'm back in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visiting my family for the holidays. I'm on the phone with his mom a day or two before Christmas. I think it was the day after his funeral. And this is when you're a newspaper man. You're at the Des Moines Register. No, I was actually, I, I was no longer at the Register. I was working for, uh, for Fox Sports. And I was thinking, at first I was like, oh, this will be a, this will be a you know 2500 word story and it can be a 10 minute feature on fox sports one and uh did they, did they know you from the paper why, how, why did they call i i had so i had connected with them because i did know people in indianola from, oh. when, I, from when i lived in, in des moines and worked at the paper and I, I just kind of like networked and made a, a bunch of phone calls and brenda got back to me and she's like come on down and yeah two weeks after his death i'm like sitting on their living room floor and i think the fact one, the fact that Zach gave these instructions, like what family, with all the shame and stigma that comes with suicide and with all the uncertainty about mild traumatic brain injury, also known as concussion, but I think we should call it MTBIs, mild, mild traumatic brain injury, because it seems a lot more serious. A concussion is getting your bell, bell rung. Mild traumatic brain injury, oh shit, we should be yeah, scared about the that. The brain injury is right there in the name. Kind yeah, of lets exactly. you know what you're dealing with. But like, there's so much, like most families would be like, are you kidding me? Like, why are you calling me right now? This family was like, yes, we want to tell this. They were so motivated to tell this. Uh, the The very first time I was, I spent four hours with them. And by the way, the whole time we're talking, the Green Bay Packers, Minnesota Vikings game is on on the TV. You right have now. that incredible detail that you check your fantasy. That your fantasy. We're checking our fantasy. And Zach's dad eventually took over his fantasy team. Um, 
which is sort of like this beautiful but kind of perverse way to pay homage to his son. Yeah. But uh, when I'm sitting there talking with them, um, at one point his older brother brings up, we're talking about actually that first suicide attempt that I read to you back in November. And he's, and he got very like kind of up in arms, like, Oh, we can't talk about, we don't want to talk about this. And I was like, okay, I'm back off, go back to it later. And I definitely sensed that he was very uncertain about this process. Everyone else was like all on board. The older brother was not. And eventually what I sussed out is that he didn't want his grandparents to be embarrassed by this. His grandparents were in their eighties, still lived in town. Uh, we're close with Zach. And this was a very public suicide attempt. People talk in small towns and he just didn't want their dirty laundry out there. He eventually came around and like, I think recognized the power in telling uh, the very dark, sad parts of this story. But at first he was the one that was like, I was like, this guy, like just from a journalist perspective, he's going to be a problem for me that I'm going to need to kind of assuage in a way. Mm -hmm. Did the, uh, I remember the GQ article, uh, the, the whole package that they put together. I, remember, I still remember the pictures of handwritten notes and it was sort of laid out in a different way than a magazine. Um, did that hit big? I mean, did you hear a lot from his friends, his family? Like not just nationally, I'm sure it got a lot of readers because yeah. it's an incredible story, but did you become sort of this teller of the story of this town, this team, all of that? Yeah. A absolutely. It was, uh, it was, I mean, like, like no story I've ever done before, both like on that, like get a buzz nationally level. And then just like in a very deeply personal level, that story came out in January. And Ryan Gosling was on the cover. And you're like, Ryan Gosling was on the cover. Yeah. Like, oh, man. <laughs> and I, it came out like, uh, I was just about to leave for an ice fishing trip. My first and only time ice fishing. Um, so I spent my entire ice fishing trip like answering twitter messages but uh in april they had which is more fun than ice fishing i was gonna say there's two type of people that go ice fishing and like you're the the kind that i would also be if i went ice fishing we, were, we were the only we had two ice fishing houses with 10 guys nine or 10 guys let me just tell you we were the only ice house on lake malax to be blaring dr dre at one in the morning probably that makes oh. sense yeah, we caught zero fish in 48 hours. Um, there, are, there are things I miss about Montana and my Midwest college years. Ice fishing is not one of them. Yeah, man. That ain't my sport. But like uh, in April, they had, so April after the story ran, they had a big gala for the foundation that they started in Zach's honor. It's called CTE Hope Foundation. I would encourage everyone to go make a donation to them. They do very worthy work. And Allie, Allie, Allie's kind of the spearheads that, right? Or yeah, she, she, she is and uh, Brenda, as well as actually Sue Wilson is sort of like one of their... Again, the three women, the same three women. Yeah. Right, you're right. The dad is not... Uh, I think he's involved, but not vocally and out front involved. But they had a gala with, with like four or 500 people in Des Moines, and I went down there for it, and we did like a little 10-minute documentary that ran with the GQ article, and that was like essentially their keynote presentation. Then Brenda came up and spoke and they were like, and here's Zach's story. And they played this video. And it was like, I was like this, you know, even if this book sells a hundred copies, hopefully it'll sell, sell way more. But even if it sells a hundred copies, it'll still be something this family can have. Oh, you get the galley copy. Look at that. Yeah, look at, there's that. Look, look, there he is. Which, which cover do you like better? Uh... Oh, yours is, yours is better, I think. Yeah, so. but you have because you have them on the back right i think i said didn't the pictures on the back yeah there you go. yeah but like this family will always have this like someone i think it was jeff perlman actually who said this to me like this is you know whether you sell, sell 100 or a million copies like this will be something that generations from now this family can be like oh this was our ancestor and he had this book written about him and this is his story and i was like that's deep man i think it's it's also worth pointing out that in a little ways uh he gets lost oh, i want to say real quick if anyone has a question we're going to do q a we have no questions yet we don't need them but if you have a question send it in now yeah. um zach kind of gets lost a little bit at times because it's about all of these things he generally does seem like a fun loving dude i mean i know this guy i grew up in montana like i said i played football i i know this guy the guy you know jocks frequently especially football guys get a bad rap 
But if you're like the lovable jock that is friends with everyone, that everyone loves that. I, I, likes that guy, and he seemed to really be that dude. He was like, everyone wants to hang out with Zach, not because he was a football stud, because he seemed like a pretty fun, down to earth guy. Just like a fun, decent human being that that everyone seems to love, and you see him in his senior year of high school, and then after, like, feel that he had lost that. And I think mm-hmm. his parents just thought, "Hey, this is, you know, this is a boy turning into a man." Like I was an idiot in my early twenties. I lost my way. Um, I think a lot of you know twenty-something young men do, and I think that's where his parents what they thought, but it, but he kept on wanting to be that old fun loving Zach that everybody loved that he loved everyone. He just lost that person. But yeah, you, you know, a Zach, even if you don't know Zach Easter, you know, this type, he's not the jock who is the bully. He's, he's, he's the guy. guy. He's the guy from election. He's, <laughs> uh, what's it, What was that actor's name? Chris? I forgot his name. I, Oh, I know who you're talking about, the character. You're the, uh, runs against Tracy Flick. Yeah, I, I was thinking of Steve Holt from Arrested Development, but it's the same sort of deal. Like, just a big jockey sweetheart who likes yeah. to <laughs> play his Thanks games. Everyone. Steve Holt uh, with, like, 20 more IQ points. Yes, right, yeah, that's true. No. Steve Holt, uh, <laughs> probably his diary would be way more boring. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah there, there's something right. about that, that that makes it especially, like, the fact that you do get a sense of him as, like, you know, a like a human being who's in the process of becoming a human being. And then just like the, the stuff he's compelled to keep secret in sort of the pursuit of trying to keep being that guy as he's overtaken by his disease and his pain is really very difficult to. And that's, I think like toxic masculinity, if we're talking about that, like that is one of the worst fruits of toxic masculinity is you don't talk about stuff, you know, his dad saying like, after his son's death, being like, therapist? I don't need no fucking therapist. Um, yeah. You know, his therapy's drinking beers with the dogs and hunting in the backyard. And, like, that's probably- the, Actually, I, have, I mean, it's a hard question, but I do you think his parents were naive, willfully sort of ignorant? Because even his mom, who was in his corner, there's enough times where you're like, is nobody really going to check on him? It's kind of yeah. like, like you yeah. just couldn't comprehend it. I don't know. Where, where do you land? I mean, you know them personally, which is, makes it a hard question, but I'm curious where you think. I think Zach's dad it was so, uh, until he realized, you know, in, in the final months of Zach's life that something was really wrong here. I think Zach's dad was so involved in this football culture that he couldn't see the forest for the trees. Um, I think once he did see it, he was terrified. And honestly, like of all the characters in this book, aside from Zach, he is the most tragic to me because he is tortured by this and yet kind of pretends that he isn't in a way. Um, his, his mom's interesting because she's a fixer, right? That's, that's her personality. She's, she's like my mom. It's like something happens and she's like, okay. I'm going to come up with six different solutions. I'm going to start right now and I'm going to get on the internet. I'm going to find it for you. And, and yet I think she saw him struggling and she was trying to fix it in small ways. Uh, just being like, again, they wake up and do your pushups, right? Like, right. Yeah. yeah. Like, but not knowing the full breadth of what was going on because I mean, he didn't tell anyone in his parents defense. Like he was really good at hiding it. Yeah. They didn't know anything until his 24th birthday when he has dinner with them and he's like guys there's something going on with my brain i think i have this thing called ct and i've been going to doctors and they're like what the fuck and zach's dad is a little bit like disbelieving because he was frankly like a cte denier before this he thought this was all like famous athletes who didn't have money anymore and just kind of lost their mind um Zach's mom just immediately went into fix a territory. I'm going to go to your doctor's appointments with you. And that almost made Zach like a little bit freaked out, like a little, little bit too much at times, um, which is where he often turns to his girlfriend who in many ways is, is his like his therapist in a way, the only one that he's really talking to about this stuff. And she's certainly a, a hero of the book, although also clearly way too young to be taking this on. Like, you know, it's, they're, they're basically like weight that nobody could carry. I mean, it was by no, the time I, she started shouldering it. Um, all right, we do have now have two questions. I want to ask you one 
uh, one question you can give a simple as you know basic answer. Um, I know you're not a doctor, but was his brain? Could anything have been done? Do you have any sense of that? Because it seems like if he was still alive, it's a worst case scenario on some level. Yeah, uh, yes, things could have been done. Even though like, like the science with CTE is so young, uh, we're, we're not years out from solving this per se, we're decades out, right? Mm -hmm. But even with that, like Zach never would have been the same Zach Easter. You see that in his writings all the time. I just wanna be the old Zach Easter. He would never be that, but he still could have been. And I think this is where Allie, you see this a lot in their text messages uh, with each other, uh, where she's like, you may not be the old Zach Easter, but you can still live a happy and productive life. And I think that with, with therapy, with speech therapy, uh, with, with, with getting memory tricks, I think he could have been a very productive person with issues, but he had, uh, CT I believe has like four stages to it. He mm -hmm. was in stage two. Uh, according to the, the brain report uh, that Bennett Amalu actually emailed uh, to Brenda. He wasn't like, you know, like when you re read about these NFL players, they're like, it was a 53 year old man with a brain that looked like a 85 year old with Alzheimer's. That wasn't Zach. He wasn't that far along. Uh, I don't think everything would have been rosy for him, but like we all, this isn't meant to minimize what he was going through. Uh, at all, so please don't take it that way. But like we all go through something in life, whether it's mental health or or health issues, or you know, you know, fill in the blank. And I think this was a very serious one. But uh, I think it is something that if he had been able to find hope, and again, the timing of this, uh, when he's really struggling with this, is when this is becoming like almost a daily news story, uh, especially relating to the NFL. People are talking about this all the time. And I think Zach just sort of reading all the news about it, uh, doing his own sort of self-diagnosis, he just lost hope. I do think there was some hope out there. It just would have taken a lot of work on his, on his part. All right. We have, do the uh, questions. We have two questions. Uh, do not have time for our Eddie Van Halen guitar solo palette cleanser. Just imagine it. We, uh, yes, we have two questions. I'll get the first one uh, from Frank Mobilo. I hope I said your name right. Uh, oh, well, this is nice. Wait, congrats on the book. Been following your work for a while. Anything next in the works on this topic or other? You know what? Uh, why, don't you, why don't we do this other question first? Yeah. Uh, we'll uh, end on the nicer one. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I have to read that one. All right. So this is from Eric Ryberg. Hello, Eric. Uh, as much as this is a sports story, it fits maybe even more cleanly into the canon of illness narratives. Did Reed refer to any other illness narratives, first person or otherwise, as guideposts for telling Zach's story? That's an interesting question. I, I don't think that I did, to be honest, uh, other than ones that I've just consumed in the past. Uh, th there were a bunch of books that I, that I certainly read like as research books, whether it was like scientific books. I read some, some really weird book about a study of pa Papua New Guinea uh, native tribe that was a not completely nonviolent tribe. And it was, the whole, whole point of that like book was about uh, whether violence is innate or something that's learned. It was a bit of a waste of my time, but it was, I thought it was interesting at the time. That's uh, the fun of doing shit like this. Because you brought it up on Squawk and Sports. Yeah, you did exactly. it. Exactly. Now it's tax it's deductible. Our book. Um, I read a lot of football books, history of football. Um, I read, uh, you, you mentioned that Steve Allman book. I read that book. That was sort of a diatribe against football. And I think you're right. It was absolutely like preaching to the choir. No big football fan who wants to continue being a football fan is going to read that book. Um, I read and some. But also, he also like made it, if you're a football fan, you're immoral. Kind of yeah, thing. That's, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's not. Right. You brought up some great points. I quoted him extensively a couple of times. Yeah. I mean, I still watch football. I watch less, but yeah. I mean, you know, that doesn't count. Well, David, David, where are you? Where are you on football? Because I, I watch less football this year only because of the pandemic and everything seems so small compared to that. But I still, I'm still a huge football fan. Yeah, same. I mean, I like watching it. 
Um, I stopped watching college football after I left SB Nation um, just because like there were people there that knew so much more about it, but, like so much of the conversation there was about it. And it was the easiest cut to make, you know, like yeah. it was never some, I didn't go to a, you know, big football program and there's a part of it. I mean, it's like the way that I eat meat, you know, that like, I, I grew up with it. I love the way it tastes. Yeah. It's been a part of my diet for my entire life. Um, I also know that the more of it I eat, the worse I feel and yeah. the harder it is to sort of justify. Um, that, that like overall, it probably has a negative impact on the world, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically like, that, like in, at every, at yeah. some level, you can sort of trace the, the, the damage to that. Uh, what's challenging with this, I think like, is that it's, it's everywhere. You know, I, I remember at the classical, I don't remember who wrote it. I mean, it was a wonderful essay. Was a, a guy who was a, a bartender who had given up on football, but had talked about the experience of being in a bar with a football game on. Like, and he's just like, I can't get away from it. It's like, it's, yeah. you know, it's like if I tried to quit drinking and stayed at this job that like there's, I, whoa, whoa. Yeah, we're, we're not even going to joke about that. But there is like an element of like the the ubiquity of it makes it hard. The idea of just like saying that you don't watch it or that I can say that I have to do it for work. But if I, you know, tomorrow, if I didn't have to write about sports anymore, I think I, you know, that's just what I do on Sundays. You know, like when the well, to me, it, I was talking about this with my brothers who are not, one of my brothers is not a big football fan. He never was, but he's kind of like, I don't, I don't really care anymore. And I said, because we're all basketball fans, that is my favorite sport. But one of the things it just boils down to is big plays in football are the best in any sport. Like they look weirder, like long bombs are hail Mary. Like there's nothing like that. in fast walk off home runs are still a guy hit. If it's not your team, it looks the same. Yeah. The occasional defensive play basketball. You get a ton of cool shit, but it happens like this in football. It's like, you could watch Patrick Mahomes run around for four seconds and then do a thing that no humans done. Like yeah. that's actually the part that I can't, let go is the big play they just they, they they're the best i watch way more highlights i watch, watch way more of the nfl.com six minutes or whatever reviews but that's not on a moral standpoint it's just like because i'm lazy yeah <laughs> also the eagles got good right when cte hit and come on that's that's <laughs> terrible that really many people talk yeah. about that as the greatest tragedy of all patrick they should still be not good uh, although Andy Reid was good, they were good. They're fine. We, we won the Super Bowl. Um, I was there, by the way. I yeah. was I was in the city right before that, but I had to leave. It was cold as shit. That it was week, super man. duper cold. I ice fished that week. Anyway, <laughs> we're running out of time. Uh, I was at DSK, uh, the German beer garden in my neighborhood, which <laughs> which is skating on thin ice. So if they have to shut it down because of COVID, I'm going to go have to. Uh, You'll do your part. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Donnelly, and I agree because I did read this. I encourage everyone to go check out the story Reed just wrote for the Star Tribune of Minneapolis following six people whose lives were forever changed by COVID. Just excellent stuff. Those are some of the hardest stories to write, and Reed's proven to be really good at the hard stuff. I have no question. Um, Patrick, you want to respond Donnelly, to that, Reed? My, my family is Donnelly's out of Philadelphia, so I just want to say a hey, Patrick Donnelly. You're welcome. Your, your pen that. name, sneaking yeah. some props in there. It's a weird, it's a weird uh, talent in a way, but like, like, like this book and like that COVID story that I spent so much time on, it was like a very gratifying story to write because it was, you know, the human toll of the pandemic, which is like, you hear all these numbers, but you, you don't hear like all these people that are dealing with all sorts of different shit. My, the weird talent that I think it is is probably my most important talent in what I do is that I'm good at talking about really depressing things. Uh, and I think that like meaning can be derived from it. So um, I think that's kind of like this book, right? Like it's super depressing. And I think there's a lot of meaning to it. Uh, not just like a cautionary tale, tale about football, but like real human meaning. Uh, I, I would say actually the, the argument about whether football should or should not be played, et cetera, et cetera, was the, uh, that that would not have worked in this book if not for just it's just a story about a pretty wonderful kid who did a thing he liked and it destroyed him and not in a way of like a musician using heroin it wasn't like a, it was a thing he liked to do and he had no real control over it I don't you know and it's 
it's it's remarkable. I am glad that uh, you got bequeathed the, the diaries. Yeah. Not everybody could do. Not everybody could do what you did, and it's it's yeah. a remarkable work. Yeah. That actually leads into the Frank question, which you should ask before we wrap up. Right. Uh, been following your work for anything in the works on this topic or other? Frank, no below or no below below. Um, you know, I, I, I have like half a mind to try to turn this book into a fictionalized TV series. <laughs> Talk about like a, something I'll put a lot of time into that won't go anywhere. But well, um, no, apparently Netflix, if you just knock on the door, you get. Well, I've heard. Yeah. Everyone, there's a, everyone needs content. Like, I feel like there, it would be a good series. Like, I want to be like Friday Night Lights, but 80% less football and Iowa and concussions, but just really a, a, a series that would be about like the darkness of small towns, like the hidden darkness of small towns. I just think it would be, could be a really good TV show because there, there's some compelling characters in this book aside from Zach um, and get into some of the weird politics of uh, rural Midwest and opiate slash meth epidemic. Uh, but I don't know. That feels like it's going to be something I pour a lot of time into that goes nowhere. Um, but uh, sort of like all of it. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> right. That's but a uh, way of describing a project. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my goal for winter. We'll see. Um, yep. I've got, I've got shit else to do this winter. I mean, uh, are you talking winter actual month or the another year of this thing we have to keep doing because we just can't. This winter. <laughs> Our, our, our endless march. Yes, our never ending. Um, all right, a uh, couple quick announcements. The next one is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, it is 1013. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, it is our first four into fiction. I will not be hosting. Uh, former Deadspin EIC Megan Greenwell will be hosting. Um, and it's with, a book with me. About, with, with Dave. And it's a book about. Um, a closeted gay college football player and his roommate who is a top recruit who doesn't really like football. So we're going back to back on football. Um, and then we are November TBD. Uh, RIP Jim Dwyer, one of the best to do it. That was very oh, sad about that. That's a shame. The, from the LA Times? Uh, no, from New York Times. Oh, the New York Times, all right. Uh, he was one of the best New York City writers um and he was pretty young 63 so that sucks uh but i want to give him a shout out if you ever want to read the best book ever written about what it's like to ride the subway for 24 straight hours find oh, sub wow. subway stories by jim dwyer it's like 92 uh he just rode the subway um uh this is all back you should get it it's great it is, it is hard great. Thing, but uh it's, it's what a, isn't it's right? a wonderful family it's Funny, a really yeah. great family story more than anything um and uh we didn't get to do eddie van halen but i'll just do this while chelsea takes us out yep perfect love the air guitar <laughs> <laughs> uh thank you reed patrick and david for tonight's wonderful conversation and reed for writing this vital book uh, and thank you to everyone who came out and had this conversation with us tonight. A reminder, if you missed any part of tonight's event or you'd just like to indulge in a rewatch, that it'll be up on our YouTube channel in a couple days. Uh, it's Greenlight Bookstore. And also a reminder that you can buy Love Zach from Greenlight either in store Tuesday through Sunday, noon to 6 p.m. or 24-7 on greenlightbookstore.com for in-store pickup or shipping anywhere in the U.S. Thank you so much again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks, guys. It's, Appreciate you guys yeah. coming. Jeff Ballard forever. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Bye.